I propose that we get started. So thank you and welcome uh, all of you to this webinar focusing on fishery subsidies and the negotiations at the WTO. Uh, for anyone who hasn't yet met me, I'm Alice Tipping and I lead work at the International Institute for Sustainable Development, uh, focusing on fishery subsidies and a number of other trade issues. Uh, we have uh, just a quick hour this afternoon. Um, so what we're, and we're, we're very conscious, I, I think that many of you, those of you who are negotiators, are extremely busy in these actual negotiations. Uh, for those of you who are, who are joining us to learn a bit more about the topic, um, you may or may not be aware that the negotiations are in a, in a particularly intensive phase. The WTO's Director General, Dr. Ngozi Okondre Iweala, has convened ministers to meet on the 15th of July. Uh, that's only about six or seven weeks from now. Um, essentially to be presented with as complete a text as negotiators can manage to craft for them, uh, for their agreement and guidance. Uh, so there are negotiations running virtually every day for most of the weeks, uh, sometimes on Saturday mornings and sometimes into the evening to try and narrow gaps. Uh, and what the negotiators are focused on and what this seminar is going to focus on is the latest text that the chair of the negotiations, that's the Colombian ambassador, uh, the latest chair, the latest chair's text that he has put on the table to structure the discussions. So for those of you who uh, can see it on the WTO website or have access to it, uh, that's document TNRLW276. Uh, it's also the first publicly available chair's text for many, many years. Uh, which is uh, of, of real interest to those of us in the civil society community because it encourages exactly engagement like this. So in the short hour that we have, uh, before we let you get on to your 3 p.m. negotiating meeting, we thought at this point in time, uh, it might be useful to run through in a very synthesized manner what's in this new text. Uh, it's an extremely important text in the context of the process. Uh, it's a text uh, in which, at least as we read it, the chair really tries to strike balances between the perspectives and the positions that he's heard. Um, so it's an important text because it really sets up this last phase of negotiations. So we thought we would give you a quick synthesis. This is what I will do next. A quick synthesis of what's the key sort of approaches taken in the text and what some of the key decisions are that are facing negotiators in the next few weeks. And then particularly because uh, it's important to get this text right, we thought you would find it useful to hear from a couple of experts outside the Geneva bubble who uh, have seen the text, who understand it, who know a lot about fisheries subsidies and fisheries policy, and can give you a couple of perspectives uh, from, their, sort of, from their experience uh, about the balances struck in the text. And so I'm delighted to have uh, the time and attention uh, of Anna Hall. She's a senior fisheries policy advisor with WWF Germany and Enrique Sanfurjo, uh, who is the director of a small scale fishers association, Pesca ABC, uh, based in uh, Baja California. Um, and what we thought is that a quick summary of the text and some perspectives from these two experts would help to set up the third part of the discussion of the session, which is a short opportunity for discussion, debate, questions and answers. Um, and so with, with that as a, as a very quick introduction, uh, what we hoped to do then was to walk through those two presentational parts of the, of the session and then have some time at the end for, for questions and debate. So uh, if you are still joining us, I'm conscious that it's only about five minutes past two. Um, welcome. I've just introduced our speakers, Anna Hall and Enrique Sanjurjo, uh, and explained that I'll do a quick overview of the text, at least as IISD reads it and what the key decisions are, and then we'll hear from the experts. So thank you for joining us. And if you're interested in fisheries subsidies, you are in the right place. Um, so. The first thing to say is that uh, the key decisions that I'm going to be talking about next are all set out with some discussion uh, and some analysis in a state of play 
policy brief, which IISD has published this morning, so it is hot off the press. Uh, you're the first in the world to see it and know about it. Um, so in the style of the state of play update that we wrote in June last year, this one summarizes and provides some narrative around the balances struck in this latest text, um, the one released on the 11th of May. So this policy brief is available on our website uh, and in the email that we send you all after this session, you'll have a link directly to it. Um, so you won't have any trouble finding it. So with all of that introduction in mind, uh, what is actually in this famous text um, and where is it potentially taking us? I'm going to walk through at least where we see the key substantive questions being in the scope of the agreement paragraph, the three substantive disciplines on IUU fishing or subsidies to IUU fishing, subsidies to overfished stocks and subsidies that contribute to overcapacity and overfishing more broadly. And then to identify what we see as some of the interesting points uh, in the institutional issues and legal issues uh, parts at the very end of the text. So what is in this new text? Oops. Starting, of course, from the very top, um, many of you who will be familiar with the text uh, will know this off by heart, but for those of you who aren't as familiar with the detail, an important reminder, what are we actually talking about in this new agreement? Um, we know in the scope, this is relatively stable, the agreement will apply to the same kinds of government expenditure as those that meet the definition of subsidies in the WTO's ASCM agreement. Uh, so the same kinds of measures covered by that agreement will be covered by these existing rules. Um, the second important point is that this agreement will speak only or govern only subsidies provided to marine wild capture fishing and fishing related activities at sea. So it's now, I think, a point of agreement. We're not talking here about subsidies to aquaculture or subsidies to inland fishing. Now, one of the really important questions members are going to need, still need to answer in the, in the context of the scope of this agreement is whether non-specific fuel subsidies should be included in this scope to capture fuel subsidies that might be provided across an economy, including the fishing sector, but also extended to others. Now, this is an idea that has been on the table for many months now. Um, it is controversial in part, we think, because fishing is so fuel intensive uh, and because fuel subsidies are provided by many members in many different forms. So this provision speaks to an important question of the scope of the agreement and how widely it works. So fuel is a sensitive issue. It's also a very important one from the perspective of the effectiveness of the agreement overall, because subsidizing the price of fuel, we know from, from academic evidence, uh, is very likely to increase fishing effort, right? So the question of fuel is an important one throughout this agreement. The first substantive rule, and again, those of you who know the text uh, will know this all very well already, but this uh, might be a useful synthesis for others. Essentially what we're talking about here, and this is in article three of the draft text, is the ideas that members would commit not to provide subsidies to fishing vessels and perhaps their operators, if that fishing vessel was found to have been engaged in IUU fishing. So most of this discussion, of course, has focused on who can make this determination. And this is one of the areas where we think there is now, it seems, a, a broadish level of agreement. So subsidies would be prohibited for fishing vessels when those vessels are subject to an affirmative determination, so a determination made by a coastal state or a flag state or the relevant regional fisheries management organization, that that vessel was engaged in IUU fishing according to the coastal or flag or RFMO rules. Um, so just as a reminder, the text also explicitly records members agreement that making a determination is not a an obligation, but it is a right that coastal states, flag states and RFMOs have. So nothing in this agreement obliges a member to make a determination. Now, the first key question, and we're going to be talking a lot about balance, um, is how the new rules ensure that the prohibition is effectively but fairly triggered. And the second key question here, which is the first question of balance, is how to ensure the prohibition is effectively but fairly applied. 
So what does the chair's text propose? Essentially, it proposes that determinations by coastal and flag states must be based on positive evidence and follow due process. Determinations by RFMOs must be made according to those RFMOs own rules. So essentially, the, the, the text seems to suggest quite an automatic trigger of the, of the subsidy prohibition. But on the other side, in response to question two, the text allows the subsidizing member to decide how long the prohibition of subsidies applies for. So this seems to be one of the, the balances struck in the text. Um, so the subsidizing member can consider in making its decision uh, the gravity of the infraction, the nature of the infraction, was it repeated, for example. So this, I guess, is one of the, the first interesting balances, right? And the first kind of important question of balance for negotiators to decide, do the proposals for under, under the two substantive elements of Article 3, do they reflect the right balance of control? between the member making the IUU determination and the subsidizing member. Two other important questions that need to be answered in the IUU fishing article, Article 3, should the prohibition apply to operators as well as to vessels? Um, and here, you know, there have been various arguments uh, on either side. Some members have argued that including operators would give the discipline much more impact. So if you, it would allow you to capture subsidies provided only to operators. And of course, a heavier penalty creates a heavier deterrent effect. But others have said this approach might punish fishers on an operator's other vessels, uh, even if those other fishers were acting legally. So there's a question, again, of, of balance and proportionality to be struck. So the chair's text for the moment leaves the word operator in brackets. Um, a final extremely important question here is what, if any, special and differential treatment would be appropriate and effective in this prohibition? So the chair's text suggests, as a middle ground attempt, I think, um, a longer time frame before the discipline would begin to apply to smaller scale fishing subject to IUU determinations for fishing that took place within 12 nautical miles of the coast. And it seems from the discussion so far, some members consider this too broad and others consider it too weak um, or too narrow rather. Um, and so I think one, one question that would be interesting to pick up in the discussion is whether this design for SNDT responds properly to the concern, at least as we understood it, which is about implementation time uh, rather than the desire to keep subsidizing small scale fishers that might be subject to an IU determination. So there's a link here to the overall implementation timeframes of the agreement, I think. The second big substantive uh, rule in the agreement, and this is in Article 4, is the idea of prohibiting subsidies to stocks that are declared to be overfished. Uh, and as you can probably imagine, um, the, the, you know, one of the two of the main questions have been, well, who decides when a stock is overfished and under what conditions? So there are probably two key substantive provisions in this article uh, where the chair, I think, has tried to strike a balance, both within the provisions and between them. So the first key question, how much difference should there be to governmental stock status decisions? Um, and over, I think sort of over the years, there have been two general approaches uh, to answering this question. Some members have proposed a very specific objective standard that would define situations in which a stock would be considered to be overfished. And others have suggested relying much more on coastal member and RFMO's own determinations or decisions of stock status. And the chair's text essentially goes more or less with the second option. So provides a lot of deference to coastal state members and RFMO stock assessments, but it does require them to use the best scientific evidence available to them when they make this assessment. So there's a kind of a, a balance there or a weight, at least as we read it, of deference to, to national and RFMO decisions. And the second question then is, has been all along, should there be some exceptions in situations when a stock is being managed back to health. And what the chair proposes as a balance between sort of the various views of yes and no, is that there should be an exception, but it should apply only to those subsidies that promote the rebuilding of the stock. 
So these might, at least to our mind, include subsidies for more selective gear that helps to avoid juvenile fish getting caught in nets, uh, or for electronic logbooks that allow more accurate reporting and support better management. Um, so it, it essentially what the balance that, at least as we read the text, seems to be proposed here is that there would be quite a lot of difference to national decisions of when a stock is overfished. But when that decision is taken, there's a relatively strict prohibition on subsidies for fishing of that stock, unless it's a, specifically a subsidy that helps to rebuild the stock that's in the overfished condition. So for us, this is sort of the one of the key questions. Do these two proposals and members' opinion strike the right balance in combining a relatively strict prohibition with a level of deference to national decision making and a relatively narrow exception uh, for subsidies to promote stock rebuilding? So that's sort of one of the, the key substantive balance and question, I think, for us in the overfished stocks pillar. Um, Third key question, also extremely important, what if any special and differential treatment for developing country members would be appropriate and effective for this particular kind of rule? And so again, the, the chair has sort of almost copy and pasted uh, the same idea um, for the overfished stocks discipline. Um, so he's proposing essentially a temporary exemption for subsidies provided to small scale fishing of overfished stocks, but within members territorial seas. So these, these could continue for a couple of years after the agreement enters into force for developing country members. And this again, as for the IUU, uh, SNDT or special and differential treatment provision, there's quite different views on whether there should be SNDT um, in this, uh, for this particular pillar. And if so, what it should look like, should it be a permanent exemption or one time limited? And so the proposal, at least from the chair, is we have one, but we make it time limited. So those are the first two substantive pillars. Uh, the last one, which um, those of you who <laughs> are in the negotiations will know backwards and inside out. Uh, and even those outside the negotiations have probably heard of more than you might wish to have, um, is this question of prohibiting subsidies that contribute to overcapacity and overfishing more generally. And this, of course, is language from the very original mandates that the WTO set for itself. Uh, and of course, from, from SDG targets 14.6. So um, what are some of the key questions? And overall, I think as we think about it, the first key question is how do we design rules that prohibit certain subsidies while allowing others without sacrificing the overall effectiveness of this rule? And over the last few months, I think our sense is some convergence has emerged over the structure and the key elements of what this discipline means or the disciplines in this pillar could look like. So unlike previous versions of the draft consolidated texts, this latest version doesn't include a placeholder for possible quantitative limits on the total amount of subsidies that members are allowed to provide, for instance. So it reflects, we think, sort of an emerging agreement that what we are going to be crafting here is a set of qualitative prohibitions. So um, essentially what the chair is proposing, and this has been an element uh, of the discussions at least since March last year, just before the pandemic, um, the chair's text suggests what's been called a hybrid approach, right? So it consists of a broad prohibition of subsidies that contribute to overcapacity and overfishing, immediately followed by a list of what those subsidies would be, um, but followed very quickly also by a relatively wide exception or qualifier to this main rule which says members would be allowed to provide subsidies listed under 5.1 if they can show that measures are implemented to keep stocks at a sustainable, biologically sustainable level. Now, it's not entirely clear whether the text requires members to demonstrate the, member, the measures are effective at maintaining the stock at a biologically sustainable level, or only that they are implemented with this objective. And this is an important question in terms of, when I say the accessibility of this provision of who can use it. A looser reading makes it much more accessible. A tighter reading would require rather more of the subsidizing member and thus make it harder to use. So that I think is the, is the, the balance that the chair is 
been trying to strike. Uh, and this, in fact, is language that's been in the last few revisions, so people will be very familiar with it, for this main prohibition in capacity and overfishing. Um, but there are other uh, further ideas for quite targeted ideas on subsidies to address very specific policy problems. Um, so the first is the idea of prohibiting subsidies to fishing in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, and then two specific ideas here. The first of these uh, is contained in Article 5.2 in the new text. And this is the idea of prohibiting subsidies that are focused on or contingent on distant water fishing. Um, so it would cover all long distance fishing in the high seas and in other members EEZs. But interestingly, this version of the text includes an exception. Again, we're talking about balance and trying to find a balance. It includes an, includes an exception for subsidized access rights that governments might provide to their fleets, as long as the subsidizing government, again, can show that measures are implemented to maintain the stocks fished at a sustainable level. So this is a particular exception included in this broader provision. Um, and the second, the second way of, of, of getting at uh, subsidies to fishing in areas beyond national jurisdiction is the idea of, in a separate provision, of prohibiting subsidies provided to fishing specifically in the high seas when it's outside the competence of a regional fisheries management organization. And then the very last idea here um, is the idea that vessels uh, that you could not you could not subsidize vessels that don't carry your flag, right? So trying to ensure that vessels receiving subsidies from one government are also under at least the flag state jurisdiction of that government. So the subsidizing state has an additional measure of control over their activities. Now, many of these rules, despite their appearance in brackets or not in the text, um, are quite acceptable to some members and very difficult for others. So in presenting all of these ideas, uh, including on IUU and on overfished stocks um, without brackets in our slides, please, as the chair has also said, don't take this as an assumption that this is all agreed, right? Um, there is still a lot of quite hard negotiating going on around many of these ideas. Um, the last uh, and sort of extremely important question on overcapacity and overfishing uh, is the question of special and differential treatment for developing country members. Um, and what's interesting here is that the latest version of the text contains two alternatives, essentially, for the SNDT that it would apply to this main prohibition, the one with the list of subsidies. So the first alternative comes from an approach proposed a number of months ago and would provide a permanent exemption from the main prohibition for LDC members, for developing members for fishing in their territorial seas and for fishing in domestic EEZs uh, for members who met any of a series of, of criteria. Um, the second alternative the chair has suggested, we presume based on the conversations he's had, um, is his own attempt um, at elabor elaborating what the language could look like. So it also has three main elements in it. The first is a permanent exemption for subsidies provided by least developed countries. The second is an exemption, which might be time limited, uh, might not, um, for subsidies by developing country members to small scale fishing. He uses the term low income resource poor and livelihood fishing within 12 nautical miles of the coast. And the third idea is a somewhat wider, but likely time limited exemption for subsidies provided by developing country members to fishing in their domestic exclusive economic zones. And the last important point is that under this alternative, the text suggests that some developing country members, those that have relatively small proportions of global catch, relatively small amounts of subsidies, could ask for extensions of the time limited exemptions uh, for artisanal fishing and for fishing in their EEZs. And the idea, one of the more controversial additions, I think, is that this extension would be subject to the approval of the committee monitoring the implementation of the agreement. So overall, um, you know, the most kind of what, what keeps striking us as we read through this is this question of balance. Is this balance appropriate? Is it acceptable? Um, so the question I think for us in our heads is, do the proposals for Article 5.1, 5.1.1, the high seas and areas beyond national jurisdiction uh, subsidy prohibitions, do all of the prohibitions and all of the exemptions strike the right balance? 
um, does this provide appropriate and effective SNDT while ensuring the agreement has some meaningful impact on subsidy patterns. Um, and these are, you will all be very much aware, um, some of the most crucial questions in the overall balance of rights and obligations here. Um, I'll speak very briefly about what we think is interesting in the legal and institutional issues, and then I'll pause. Um, so firstly, in fact, the most interesting part we think of the new text uh, on the legal and institutional issues side is the question of transparency. So there's been a lot of discussion about what more notification information this agreement should require, what is really necessary to monitor compliance, and what might be needed for other reasons. And so what the text does is that it takes the list of additional fisheries related information that's been put on the table for notification and divides it into two sections. Some things would be mandatory and some things would be sort of best endeavors to the extent possible. So it would be mandatory to notify information on the type of fishing activity, the catch data of the fisheries being subsidized, and to the extent possible, information on the status of the stocks and the conservation measures in place. And what's interesting here is that members, according to the text, would be allowed to use the exemptions only with respect to subsidies they have notified and use management-based exemptions. That was, the, one, that was the, the exemption for subsidies that contribute to the rebuilding of a stock, for example, or management measures implemented uh, to keep stocks at a sustainable level. You could only invoke those exemptions if you had notified the status of your stocks and the measures that you later want to rely upon. Um, so there's an interesting sort of link and additional element of balance being proposed there. Um, some more kind of lawyers questions, remaining question to answer, should the agreement be structured uh, as an annex to the subsidies agreement or to the Marrakesh agreement? And what sort of monitoring role uh, should a committee hold? And these are still questions where at least our impression is the chair has included sort of the default position on many of these options in the text. Uh, and it is for members to propose and seek consensus on an alternative if they really feel strongly that an alternative um, is what they would prefer. So um, that I'm conscious is uh, an extremely quick run through. The last point, of course, um, which has been uh, in the background of the negotiations for a long time and on which the text has not yet changed, is the question of whether this agreement should address situations of disputed jurisdiction. And again, the chair has kept the same ideas, I think, in the text. Um, the agreement uh, and the results of any WTO panel dispute underneath it will have no legal implications regarding maritime jurisdiction in any other fora. And the idea that a dispute settlement panel shouldn't look at, shouldn't consider any claims under this instrument that require it to look at issues of contested jurisdiction. This is again, like SNDT and the question of fuel subsidies, one of the extremely sensitive questions in the negotiation. We all can understand why. Um, and it is sort of language which has not changed in a while, I, I suspect, because a clear, better alternative has not yet emerged. But that does not mean by any means that all members are comfortable with this as a solution to the concern. It's just that we don't have a better idea yet, at least as my reading. Um, that is an extremely quick run through. It's described uh, more eloquently and less quickly uh, in the policy brief, which is on our website. So I encourage you to have a look at that if you're interested. Um, what I will do now perhaps uh, is seek the views of people outside the Geneva bubble um, and invite perhaps first Anna uh, and then you Enrique to give us your sense um, of the chair's text and the balance it strikes. What do you think is good? What do you think could be improved? Uh, 